2024 will be a decisive, pivotal year in the war in Ukraine, which, in my opinion, will not only decide the outcome of the war, but also whether the current, rules-based world order will survive. Following the failed Ukrainian summer counteroffensive, Western aid has visibly declined. What's worse, Putin's sympathizers in the US and the EU, the Republican Party and the Hungarian government are delaying two key, extremely important aid packages. In some sense, we are at the lowest point. However, there is reason to believe that this is a temporary state of affairs and that the Kerch Bridge will be dropped in 2024. How exactly? Well, this video is here to explain. The topics I'll be covering are the following. The battlefield situation, meaning where each side is militarily and what's happening along the front line, the political situation in Russia, Ukraine and the West in terms of the war, the goals and potential end games of each side, and the risks they face. Then I will briefly talk about the idea of Western Game Changer Tech, I'll cover the potential special decommissioning operation of the Kerch Bridge and the current prognosis as to how the war might end. Finally, I'll recommend channels not to follow for war updates and channels that are worth following. So let's dive in. A lot has been said about who's winning the war in Ukraine. Russia took over a street west of Donetsk, well obviously Russia is making progress and winning the war. Ukraine threw some soldiers over the Dnipro, well obviously Ukrainians are just days away from a massive landing operation where they'll take back Crimea. In reality, the war has bogged down with neither side able to achieve breakthrough. Some have characterized this as a Ukrainian defeat and or Russian victory, but that's a misunderstanding of the situation. As a reminder of how we got here, the first big Russian blitzkrieg was defeated, Ukrainians beat Russians out of Kiev, Kharkiv and Kherson, and then helped solve the overcrowding problem in the Russian prison system by slowly pulling out of Bakhmut. Then a Ukrainian counteroffensive followed in the south, which was halted by the Russians before it could achieve any major breakthroughs. In the meantime, visually confirmed Russian hardware losses stand at around 14,000, and Russian manpower losses are between 315 and 360,000, according to Vladimir Putin. Russia currently holds around 18% of Ukrainian territory and is importing shells, possibly rockets of questionable quality, from North Korea. So any reports about the supposed Russian victory or Ukrainian defeat should be considered with this context in mind. Russians in the meantime are conducting large offensives around Abdivka, which consists of commanders yoloing their troops into Ukrainian lines. The only noteworthy Russian success recently was the takeover of Mariinka west of Donetsk, a settlement that has been contested for a decade and which is just a patch of rubble at this point. The general dynamic now seems to be Ukrainian digging in and defending, while Russians reenact their Vukhladar offensive across multiple locations. The other hot location outside of Avdivka being the northeast edge of Kharkiv Oblast. And in one of these areas, based on videos that surfaced on the 13th of January, apparently a Ukrainian Bradley managed to take out a Russian T-90M tank with its 25mm Bushmaster auto cannon. You can find the video via search. I want to avoid showing combat footage since that's a sure way to get demonetized. Alright, so who's doing quote-unquote better? When comparing the two armies, Ukrainians seem to be better equipped and have high higher morale on average, and they do have a technological edge in terms of hardware. Russians, on the other hand, compensate for worse equipment by having numerical superiority in pretty much everything. Importantly, they have an absolute shell superiority and have an asymmetrical advantage in terms of long-range rockets. When it comes to Russian manpower, though, the Ukrainian counteroffensive did degrade them quite a lot. In terms of vehicles, Russia has more, but they still rely heavily on stockpiles. According to Covert Cabal, who bought satellite images and simply counted the number of vehicles Russia has stored, every year the number of Russian tanks in storage sinks by 1,200, with their latest amount from October 2023 being 3,500 good tanks without obvious signs of damage and 2,000 additional tanks that obviously need repairs. In terms of BMPs and other fighting vehicles, not including tanks and artillery, Russia had 3,677 BMPs stored in depots and 5,240 similar vehicles such as BTRs, MTLBs and so on. So that's around 9,000 in total. This is once again according to Covert Cabal. As of January 2024, Oryx lists around 5,000 of such vehicles lost after two years of war, which translates to about 2,500 per year. In terms of artillery, based on Covert Cabal's July 2023 numbers, Russia had 7,500 towed artillery in storage and 4,400 self-propelled guns. And they're pulling 3,000 towed artillery pieces from storage per year and about 300 self-propelled guns. So on all these fronts, we can say that Russia has about two to three years left before their current storages run out. With this information, I'd like to help dispel the myth that Russia can just keep up this war indefinitely. Unless they find a way to multiply their new production, time is not on their side, contrary to what many commentators would want you to believe. Additionally, there is a growing lack of workers in the Russian economy, which I'll discuss in a bit. And now, let's look at the political layout of the Ukraine war. In the West, attitudes towards Ukraine seem to have cooled somewhat. A good example is Joe Biden shifting from as long as it takes to as long as we can when referring to supporting Ukraine. In the meantime, the isolationist, authoritarian-friendly far-right is gaining
gaining prominence across the West, and those movements are almost universally pro-Russian. The Ukrainian summer counteroffensive's failure has only emboldened those actors. 2024 also brings its own risks with the US elections. If Donald Trump wins the election and starts enacting an autocracy, the US military will inevitably coup him and temporarily take control of the government. This will be rather disruptive in terms of aid to Ukraine and might mean a multiple-month halt in supplies while a provisional government sorts itself out. But US support is not the only one, of course. Recently, Britain announced a 2.5 billion pound aid package, for example, containing long-range missiles, air defense, artillery ammunition, and maritime security. Put a pin in that first one especially, the long-range missiles, because they'll be relevant soon. Despite this aid, the past months have been the lowest in terms of aid provided to Ukraine. The failure of the summer counteroffensive therefore risks becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy where, due to a lack of battlefield success, there is less political will to provide aid, therefore Ukraine gets less aid, therefore they cannot achieve battlefield success, therefore there is less aid. This should change, however, when hopefully EU and US aid packages get approved in the coming weeks. But pro-Russian Republicans are nonetheless a worrying trend who represent a new, authoritarian movement on the American right. These people are no longer the usual neoconservatives who, a few weeks ago, even criticized Biden for not doing enough for Ukraine. These new Republicans, the MAGA variety that are slowly taking over the party, are overtly sympathizing with far-right dictators across the globe. If Trump gets elected in 2024, these people are expected to run amok. Hopefully that won't happen, because a US military coup against an authoritarian mega government would complicate things in terms of Ukraine. So this is the political situation in the West. Now let's look at Ukraine. There is an increasingly visible conflict between the civilian and military leaderships between Zelensky and Zoluzhny. As the war stopped being an existential threat and became a question of do we lose 20% of our territory or not, political maneuvering is back in the game. I've read reports about Zelensky skipping the chain of command and communicating with Ukrainian frontline officers directly without Zaluzhny's knowledge. In addition, the political leadership had the brilliant idea of firing all regional recruitment officers after one of them got caught in a corruption scandal. This inevitably caused Ukrainian recruitment numbers to tank temporarily at a time when Ukraine sorely needs fresh troops. Zelensky's office seems to be worried about Zaluzhny's popularity and how it might translate to him becoming a political opponent to them once the war is over. In other words, now that the mortal danger is over, politics continues as usual. But before anyone would panic, this doesn't hamper the Ukrainian war effort that much. So far it's in the nuisance category, where it hopefully remains. Otherwise, as the war drags on, the first discussions are happening across Ukrainian society about how long the war should go on, whether they should concede at least some territory in exchange for peace. The percentage of those who do not want concessions is still high, around 74%, but those willing to accept conceding territory have risen from 10% in May 2023 to 19% in December 2023. And before anyone would judge people for thinking that, try losing a friend, father or husband in the war, or live for two years with the fear of losing them, which can basically happen at any moment. Another topical issue in Ukraine is mobilization, which seems to be relatively unpopular, understandably so. There is a lack of manpower, in part because of the aforementioned firing of all regional recruitment officers. There was also a controversial mobilization bill submitted, which was deemed poorly written and unjust. The bill has been withdrawn since then, and a better one is in the works. This is an advantage of democracy. Bad decisions can be criticized and forced to be reconsidered by the people. In the meantime, the Ukrainian economy is maintained by Western, in particular EU funds. And despite Viktor Orban's threats of derailing support for Ukraine, the situation is not so straightforward. Multiple member states took issue with different aspects of the funding approach, so consensus was needed to proceed. Now that this seems mostly done, Ukraine will get monetary aid, and Viktor Orban will be sidestepped if needed through complicated legal processes. So despite all the media hype about Orban and his obstructionism, he really doesn't amount to more than an annoyance at this moment. Now let's take a look at Russia, their political and economic situation. The Russian political system is more stable than ever. It's safe to say that Russia is under the complete control of the government. Putin increasingly builds his legitimacy on the war, trying to draw a parallel between the war against the Nazi invasion of Russia. They aren't particularly bothered by the fact that back then Nazi Germany attacked them, well now they are the invaders. Russian society seems to continue to support Putin and is generally accepting of the war. According to a Levada poll in October 2023, 20% of Russians supported the war, 29% rather supported it, 35% rather opposed, and 15% opposed. That's a near 50-50 ratio, but we should also consider that Putin's current approval rating is at 83%. The tolerance threshold of Russian society seems to be general mobilization, which Putin seeks to avoid at all costs. So basically, people will tolerate the current state of affairs as long as they themselves don't get drafted. Russia doesn't need a new wave of mobilization for now, as there are enough volunteers due to financial incentives. There are also other, hidden incentives, such as families of the deceased getting a brand new Lada. If your husband is violent, abusive and so on, here's the chance to get rid of him and get a new car in the process. So once again, the population seems to be largely on board with or tolerant of the war, as long as it doesn't affect them that much. Otherwise, Russia has done a decent job converting into a wartime economy, which is quite stable for the time being. I've seen estimates of it being able
able to stay afloat for another two to three years, barring unforeseen factors. Now let's move on to more interesting stuff, namely the potential endgame scenarios of the war. As I've said, this here is pivotal in determining the war's outcome, so let's look at the goals of each side. The original Russian goal was the capture and subjugation of Ukraine and the end of the pro-Western Ukrainian state. This has obviously failed, and aside from public statements, the Russian leadership isn't seriously counting on it. The current revised goal is likely either a frozen conflict which prevents Ukraine from joining the EU or NATO, or a ceasefire, both allowing Russia to rebuild its army and try again. The Ukrainian goal was, and still is, the complete liberation of all occupied territories, including Crimea. At the moment, the chances of this appear remote, and there are the aforementioned conversations within Ukrainian society whether these goals should be scaled back in exchange for peace. But can there be peace between Russia and Ukraine? Currently, nobody seems interested in it, and for good reason. You don't give up the fight if you think you're winning, or if you think you can't afford to lose. Both sides represent a mixture of these two lines of thinking. Recently, there was an interesting article in the New York Times, however, alleging that Russian officials are starting to broach the topic of ceasefire in secret. The article writes that a similar thing happened in the fall of 2022, after the Ukrainians kicked the Russians out of the Kharkiv region. The idea then was that Putin would be satisfied with territories held at that time, but that he won't concede any of it. Are these quiet gestures meaningful, or are they just the usual bluff to throw us off? I believe they are real, but so far they should not be taken that seriously beyond taking a mental note. It's true that Putin is very risk averse, and that the war being bogged down includes Russians as well. He also knows that he's not taking Ukraine due to Western support, even if it has been flagging recently. At this point, to what end is the Russian army fighting in Ukraine? Storages are emptying out at a worrying rate, heavy equipment losses are catastrophic, and even if they did take over Ukraine somehow, they don't have the manpower to fight the ensuing insurgency. With this in mind, it's plausible that the Russian leadership would low-key start talking about negotiations to bring up the idea of outlining a plan for a ceasefire in the midterm. Maybe. It's a very basic strategy of hedging your bets in advance. That being said, currently, Ukraine not liberating the entirety of its territory looks more likely than not. I'd like to stress that currently part. Things can and do change. There is a certain level of war fatigue in the West and Ukraine, plus there is the looming threat of the 2024 US elections, as US support to Ukraine seems to correlate with Joe Biden's cognitive abilities. With that in mind, let's take a look at the potential endings of the Ukraine war. As I said in the beginning, 2024 will likely decide not just the outcome of the war, but whether the rules-based world order survives or not. If a country can start a war of territorial conquest and get away with it, then others can do it as well. That would mean the advent of a new world order, based on might makes right, where strong nations can do whatever they please as long as nobody can stop them. In practice, this would mean an era of constant smaller regional wars, possibly between nuclear nations. So now let's look at the potential outcomes of the Ukraine war. The perfect outcome is of course Ukraine beating Russia with Western help, restoring control over the entirety of its territory, opening the door to EU and NATO membership. The less perfect outcome is Ukraine conceding some territory, but nonetheless joins the EU and NATO, cementing the peace. A subpar outcome would be Ukrainian territorial concessions that aren't followed with EU or NATO memberships. Instead, there would only be a collection of bilateral agreements, which Russia may or may not respect. Wink, wink. A bad outcome would be the war ending with a peace agreement, but without any security agreements or EU membership. At that point, another Russian invasion would just be a matter of time, where Russia would use the next few peaceful years to reorganize and reconstitute its army, getting ready for round two. A very bad outcome would be if there wasn't even a peace agreement. If the war simply devolved into a frozen conflict, preventing Ukraine from rebuilding itself, counting the days till the next inevitable Russian invasion. And finally, there is the catastrophic scenario. In that, Trump gets selected in 2024 without anyone stopping him, a far-right, authoritarian, isolationist US government pulls out of NATO, essentially collapsing it, and leaves Ukraine to its own devices. Due to the lack of aid, Ukrainians are gradually pushed back until the conflict becomes frozen with large Russian territorial gains. At that point, the rules-based world order is over, as there is no one left to uphold it. Further millions of Ukrainian refugees stream into Europe, and Russia starts to gear up for the next round, but this time Moldova and the Baltics are also on the list. At that point, in my opinion, we would almost certainly see an attempted Chinese invasion of Taiwan as well. Which of these outcomes will come true? We'll know more at the end of the year. Both Russia and Ukraine face risks along the way though, which will play a large part in determining the outcome. For Ukrainians, the risks are manpower issues, low Western support in the form of small aid packages and lack of military industrial output, the massive Russian terror bombings against civilian infrastructure, and the rise of the far-right authoritarian pro-Russian populists, such as Gert Wilders, Viktor Orban, and the AFD in Germany. Russian risks, on the other hand, include limited stockpiles and the increasing lack of good hardware. Also, manpower issues in the economy, namely the millions missing from the labor market. With that said, what about Western game-changing tech? Ukrainian pilots are already training on F-16s, they have M1 Abrams tanks, Leopards, and so on. Such hardware does help a lot, especially F-16s. However, I wouldn't view them as wonder weapons. Just like how Russian Iskander or Kinzhal missiles didn't magically win the war for them. They only make things more difficult for the enemy. 
enemy. There are also issues with Ukrainian equipment, namely the Leopard tanks, which have a low operational readiness. From what I could gather, it's the lack of spare parts, the fact that the tanks need to be repaired in Lithuania, and that Ukrainian mechanics weren't properly trained to maintain them. So far, the trend with German tanks and self-propelled guns seems to be it works great until it doesn't. A common issue seems to be overuse and the fact that NATO hardware isn't quite configured for this type of large-scale attrition or war. Ukraine seems to have or had access to Atakams, the army tactical missile system, namely a small batch the US sent them, which was used to nail a Russian forward airbase, damaging or destroying multiple Russian helicopters. But we haven't had information about additional deliveries since then, not to mention Ukrainians received the oldest possible variant, the M39 Block 1 with anti-personal bomblets that has half the range, 165 kilometers, compared to the most modern Atakams variant. On a personal note, I find this rather infuriating. Israel can level the Gaza Strip with the most modern American weapons, while Ukraine, defending itself against an imperialist invasion, gets only 30-year-old leftovers slated for decommissioning. However, Ukraine also received Storm Shadow missiles from the UK, which are very useful as we'll soon see. Game changers aside, what does help Ukraine is not wonder weapons, but the sheer mass production of shells, mortar or artillery. In this area, thankfully there is progress. Aside from efforts to revive Ukraine's domestic defense industry, there are plans in the EU for a 100 billion euro defense fund and to ramp up shell production to 1 million per year. This progress has hit political snacks so far, many countries are hesitant to pour money into defense. But we'll know more after the February EU summit. So this is the current situation. The front lines are mostly static. Ukraine is having issues with manpower and the unpopularity of conscription. Western support is low for the time being and they're suffering from ever-present ammo shortages. On the Russian side of things, conscription is also unpopular and there are also manpower issues, but on the economy side, with millions missing from the labor market. Additional Russian problems include the quick depletion of their hardware stocks, which, unlike shells, cannot be produced that fast or that quickly. There is also the added problem of Crimea. With that, let's talk about the Kerch Bridge, as promised in the beginning. You might have seen the news about Ukraine destroying the Novocherkask, a Ropocha-class landing ship. That's the third destroyed large landing ship, with two more damaged, in addition to three other damaged or destroyed smaller landing ships. Now, why would Ukraine focus on such ships, like the Novocherkask, expending valuable and rare Storm Shadow missiles against it? Well, suppose something happens to the Kerch Bridge, whereby it's no longer usable by road or rail. If that important link is cut, Crimea and the Russian troops in the Kherson region need to be supplied somehow. So how do you move some supplies across the Kerch Strait without a bridge. Large landing ships, which Ukraine seems to be targeting. It's not hard to see how such strikes could be a potential prelude to the Kerch Bridge being dropped. The US has been hesitant to supply long-range Atakams missiles because they're worried Ukraine would use them against targets inside official Russian territory. But the Kerch Bridge is not official Russian territory. So suppose the Americans deliver just a handful of Atakams missiles for a very specific mission. In addition, Ukraine has its own domestically produced ballistic missile, the Ikhrim-2, which has been in development for a while. And there has been speculation about Ukraine having already used, or rather tested one on Russian targets, in the form of a strike on the Saki Air Base in Crimea in August 2022, 220 kilometers away from the front line. At that point, Ukraine did not have any of the Western long-range missiles. A Ukrainian official stated after the strike that they used a device exclusively of Ukrainian manufacture. So I personally do not rule out a special decommissioning operation of the Kerch Bridge in 2024. This would somewhat complicate the situation for Russians. Aside from the global PR catastrophe, having to manually supply Crimea would siphon away precious logistical resources. Not to mention, Russian positions in and around the Kherson region would get weaker, and now you also need to supply Russian civilians in Crimea as well. This would of course help reinvigorate support for Ukraine, and would give the Ukrainian government a much stronger hand in any future negotiations. But for now, this is a speculation. Well-informed speculation but still speculation. For the time being, instead of daydreaming about the Kerch Bridge, what you can do is vote for pro-Ukrainian politicians if you have the chance, or donate to trusted fundraisers, for example for FPV drones. But it's also important to stay informed about the whole situation. Unfortunately, aside from trustworthy sources, many grifters have also attached themselves to the Ukraine war, spreading misinformation for engagement and ad revenue. So here are some of the most notorious accounts that you should avoid if you want accurate coverage. Visegrad24 is a channel you should immediately unfollow. This page is a hub for sloppy journalism and misinformation. Their latest stunt was spreading unsubstantiated rumors about Gerasimov being dead. Another terrible source you should avoid is Chuck Farrer, whose maps are more military fanfiction than reality. And the worst of the bunch is Igor Sushko, who single-handedly started a global disinformation cycle about Russia being hours away of starting a nuclear war. If you want to follow trustworthy sources instead, here are some of my recommendations. 
Tatarigami underscore UA is a great source with accurate and honest commentary who isn't afraid to point out issues within the Ukrainian military and political system. The Institute for the Study of War is of course a go-to for detailed battlefield updates. Michael Kaufman, the god of Ukraine war analysis, is also a must-follow. I also recommend Andrew Perpetua and his very detailed, verified and geolocated map at map.ukrdailyupdate.com. There is also Rob Lee, who brings you accurate and verified local level updates and events. Finally, on YouTube, there is Perun, who I'm sure many of you already follow. His videos about the Ukraine war are what this video aspires to be when it grows up. In closing, 2024 will be quite a year for both Ukraine and the international world order. Much will depend on whether Western shell production will keep up, what the outcome of the US election will be, a potential strike against the Kerch Bridge, and so on. And if you're worried about the current situation, don't be. The battlefield has more or less stabilized, and Ukraine is bound to get more support, hopefully in the short term. If you'd like to worry nonetheless, I recommend starting on the 5th of November this year, once the US presidential election kicks off. In the meantime, keep yourself informed, vote for pro-Ukraine politicians, and donate to various trusted pro-Ukraine fundraisers if you can, and or sign up for my Patreon. Thank you for watching, and I'll be seeing you next time.